sensibilities. Our common senses are extraordinary. Our quest is how do we look beyond what we think we see to find the truth that is all around us. Recently, I was in a group of people, um, and a stranger came over. Actually, they were all strangers because I was there giving a workshop. And a stranger sort of kept, came into the group, and the hairs on the back of my neck went right up. Ooh. And one of the women that was beside me went, oh, perhaps in response to the fact that I don't have a very good poker face, said, oh, he makes the hair on the back of my neck stand straight up. And then she laughed. <laughs> and I said, mine too. But I didn't laugh. And I asked, why don't we listen to that? Now this isn't to say anything about a global who he was. This is to say at that moment, that interaction, there was something not good. Yeah, not something so right. You know? And so, what does that mean? You know? I mean, we have been so trained not to listen to our bodies, not to heed the call that we're no longer aware half the time of even feeling when the hackles, the hairs on the back of our neck go up or our gut feelings. But to quote Pierre Théard de Chardin, who is one of my heart theologians, quote, we are not human beings having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. Now, whether you think that we're spiritual beings having a human experience, or humans having a spiritual being, or the fact is that we are having both of them concurrently at the same time. So, if your theology doesn't match my theology, no, it's fine. But we're both here together. So why are we so quick to deny the experience of others, or our own? I mean, think of children and tummy aches. Think of yourself as a child when you had a tummy ache. I mean, I had butterflies driving down here. Like, I can see faces, because I always have butterflies. You would think that I wouldn't by now, right? I do this for a living. So I asked them, what is their job? which might not necessarily seem so sensible, but I figured, I asked them, and, and I believe their job is to keep me frosty. It's to help me do my best. They're butterflies after all, they're not caterpillars. I mean, we like to think that we're sensible people. We do. I mean, no one likes to be called senseless. We're told they were done something, a senseless act. You know, and, and oh, use your common sense is a plea that we use all the time. And how many of you in this room have been sort of bemoaning the kind of collective loss of our country's common sense recently? <laughs> but really, the reality is that we are far more enamored of extrasensory than we are of sensory. We want superheroes with super senses. We want psychics who can see into the future, and we want mediums who can tell us about the past. And yet we fail to listen to our real embodied senses, sometimes because of false ecclesiastical reasons. Some of us feel this world is temporal, and only the internal world is real. Some of us feel this world is an illusion, and underneath it all is the world that is real. Sometimes the separation stem from erroneous ideas of what sins of the flesh are. Hint, they're not the sensual ones. They're the community-breaking ones. The sensual without the divine. That is the sin. They're not sexual activities. They are murder and rape. Those are the sins of the flesh, just like lust and greed and all the rest of the deadly sins but not touch, not the touch and the sound and the smell of love. Be it for a sexual partner, a sensual flower, or a happy mud-covered dog, all of that is godly. We rattle on about being mindful and the importance of mindfulness, and you've probably heard me do it here from this very location. But. How many of us 
take the mind out of mindfulness and put it into our body. We're just totally caught up in the mind. How many of you have seen dog tackles go up? Halloween cats. Yeah, everybody here's got a dog. Yeah. It's called pilo erection or pilo erection, depending on where you learn the word. And it seems to occur in all mammals. It's defined by Webster's Medical Dictionary as quote, the involuntary erection of bristling of hairs due to sympathetic reflexes, usually triggered by cold, shock, or fright, or due to a sympathomimetic agent. Oh, that's what that is. It has been observed in non-human mammals and some birds as assisting in heat retention, cooling, drying of the skin, threat defense, fear protection, aggression, arousal, insecurity defense, and upon encountering new stimuli. And yet we also have doctors and texts which will tell you that there is, quote, no known benefits of this response in humans. Perhaps we're just not paying attention. The hairs on the back of your neck, they're not the same ones in the arms or your upper arms when you say you need to go put on a sweater, right? Hmm. Fear, cooling. We spend most of our days with our skin covered. And quite frankly, being able to habituate to clothing in this society, it's a good thing. And if you've ever been with a child or someone who's elderly who cannot unlock that disinhibition to having the feel of clothing, it's a struggle. It's a very real struggle. So it's important that we have to lose the awareness to our socks or our underwear. And even by just saying underwear, just for a moment, everybody in this room became aware of their underwear. <laughs> That's the mind. It's not a bad thing. You can stop now. <laughs> oh wait, no, I just re triggered it, didn't I? <laughs> it's now widely known that infants that are not cared, lovingly, held gently and caressed, they fail to thrive. It's now becoming increasingly apparent that our elderly are also failing to thrive for lack of loving touch, for lack of being caressed. In a wonderful study that carries the tagline, Cuddle That Rat, it's one of my favorites from my early studies in the, I guess it was the early 90s. They showed that baby rats that were held, groomed, and caressed by their family and their siblings, or by human researchers, important or there, had significantly larger neural network than those that weren't. They were smarter. They got along with other rats better. We primates, like rats, we need touch to survive to live, and to know ourselves in community. We need to touch ourselves, not just mentally or emotionally, but physically. Without that, our shells become brittle. Our sense of touch is broken. Handshakes become contests of will, rather than exchanges of friendship. Holding hands in our culture is reserved for controlling the young, don't you let go of my hand in this store. Or for cisgendered heterosexuals. Although that is changing. We still now have an awareness. Oh, how nice to see two men holding hands. We're still aware of it. Have you ever been to a drum circle? Anybody here not ever been to a drum circle? <coughs> or a symphony or a loud rock concert? and felt that pulse beating through you, that too is your sense of touch. We are unique, individual, divine drum heads. Take a deep breath. I say that often, right? All the time. I don't think I've ever done a sermon that I don't say, take a deep breath. But I hardly ever say, take a deep sniff, good. Take a good whiff. Yeah, I don't say that. But how often do we really stop and smell the flowers? I mean, looking at some aisles in our stores, oh my heavens, we spend more time spritzing, spraying, plugging in, banishing smells and smelling them to the point where now everything advertised, we eliminate smells. <laughs> eliminate the smell. They have names like the Eliminator. Wow. What does that mean? I've, I love the sense of smell. I fell in love with a sense of smell in part because I fell in love with dogs. And for dogs, their sense of smell is how they see their world. It's akin to our sense of sight. So it's really interesting to me that the new studies show that rats, rats are a 
100% more effective in diagnosing tuberculosis and faster than any test or machine we have. So it's not just dogs with the schnoz. And bears maybe have the highest sense of smell of all. But guess what we also have? We also have a sense of smell that is critical to us, and we get it at seven months utero, 28 weeks inside our mommy's tummy, we develop our sense of smell. And a newborn infant can recognize the sense of breast milk, and specifically their mother's breast milk, and identify their own amniotic fluid against all others. Not only that, but within those first weeks, all of the smells that they're surrounded by become intimately associated with that same act of nursing and caregiving. But we also, right from the start, start deadening the sense of smell. Oh, caca, bad, 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 what a horrible smell. So we no longer know what is a good poopy smell and what's a bad poopy smell. All poopy smells bad. No, actually, it doesn't. It's really important to know. My grandmother could tell from across the room, you gave that baby fish. It's too early. She knew her poop. It probably saved generations. By pushing it all down, it's become a primary trigger for trauma if not the primary trigger, but there's good news. Dr. Kerry Ressler, who is both an MD and a PhD, director and researcher of McLean Psychiatric, which is a psychiatric institute that's attached to Harvard, is very, very hopeful that they found a key player in the treatment of PTSD, which is very close to my heart. It, meaning smells, the only sensory system that we have specific genetic tools that allow us to dissect how different odors in the environment activate different neural pathways. This gives us a powerful tool for using genetic approaches to understanding how the brain codes for the environment. One of the ways that the brain codes trauma is by increasing sensitivity to the trauma cues in the environment. What we want to start learning is how do we code peace? How do we code well-being? Aromatherapy is more than just lavender in your soap. I mean, what if breast milk just may be one of the scents that can bring you back to your sense of being here now, safe and secure? What if the smell of rich, loamy earth? What might it be the smell of your hand? Just put your hand right up. What if it's the smell of your hand? that helps produce a sense of calm because it's so infused with who you are and what you love. We're all born with sweet tooths. Glucose is a newborn's favorite chemical taste um, with glutamate coming up right next to it. And both are naturally occurring organic elements in breast milk. Both are also present in Twinkies and fast Chinese food <laughs> as high fructose corn syrup and MSG. <laughs> We're wired for junk food. Literally. And if our palates are not taught at an early age otherwise, we confuse the two. So is it the smell of breast milk that pulls you back? Or is it a Twinkie? How many of you taste the air in the morning? <laughs> eh, kind of, maybe, <laughs> sort of. Ooh, yeah. Why is peppermint the taste of its clean mouth? Ask yourself that question. Go Google it. It's kind of interesting. My grandfather, every morning, went out onto the porch and went... He tasted the air. He smelled the air. He needed to know which direction the wind was coming from. He was a fisherman. He was a sailor. He was a boat builder. He lived on an island. There was no weather channel. He needed that information, and it was accessible to him. We are listening. This is we are listening before we are speaking. 
We need to go back to that practice, right? We are listening in the womb, and we recognize our mother's voices over any others. We will recognize them, and we prefer our native language, and we respond to sounds that we learned in utero. My son was born with no fear response to aggressive dogs. I worked in the Board of Health kennels until they told me I couldn't anymore. I was eight, a little bit over eight months pregnant. I watched a Rottweiler go tearing after my dog, my child, when he was about three, and he just stood there, completely relaxed. The dog came up, grabbed his shoulder, and he just looked. The dog had been barking and growling, and everybody was terrified, and he just stood there, and the dog stopped which is enough time for us to get a board of health around the dog. And the dog did lose his life because, of course, he, my son had no punctures. He had a small bruise. He had no fear response because he had been so overly exposed. Thank heavens that dog was not predatory. Because what I did was totally irresponsible. And had that be not just a bad hooligan of a dog, but a predatory dog, I wouldn't have a child. These are things we don't think about when we think, who's listening? What are we hearing? What is that doing to how we are in the world? Because hearing, it's not the same of listening. How many of you notice that our hearing is always on? There's a lot, a lot of conversation. Like, you know, we go to sleep, we close our eyes, but our hearing, it's always on. Yeah, well, actually, so are all of our other senses. As one researcher put it, quote, our senses aren't dimmed in sleep. There's no effective way to turn off our senses. The best way to explain what happens in sleep is that at some point, the last point, actually, our cognitive processing of sensation changes. And that is, our higher brain functions allows us to ignore certain sensory input. Like you guys not remembering that you're wearing underwear. Oh, wait. <laughs> this effect has been the most studied in sound perception. But it's not only sound perception that has it, but it's most studied. We learn to hear certain sounds, but not others while we sleep. Thus, alarm clocks will wake up some, and not others. But babies crying, <coughs> and cats about to vomit, can almost wake the dead. <laughs> But if a dog hears the world at a higher pitch than we do and knows the world through his nose, we know ours through our eyes. They are the windows of our soul. Right? But Harry Houdini said, what the eye see and the ears hear, the mind believes. How many of you ever had someone like crack that egg over your head when you were in high school? and then have the egg drip down. You close, yeah, yeah, there's some nodding. If you haven't, we can do that during coffee hour. <laughs> because you get shown an egg, you get told, and then it will, and you hear the sound, hear the information, see the egg, and your body says, oh no, there's egg dripping down my face. Nope. But what we see is what we've been trained to see. We see what we expect to see. I mean, this is such a problem that we have now laws that put eyewitness testimony as a primary in our judiciary. At the same time, we've got science that proves that eyewitness testimony is the worst testimony out there. We have people going to jail because they're pulled out of lineups based on sight when there is reams of science that says, this is a bad idea, folks, not accurate. And yet, all of us in this room at some point have said, well, I know what I saw. I know what I saw. It's our primary. Learning how to see what is before you, really before you, is a task of re-educating your senses. And I know no more humbling and perhaps sacred way, but you know I'm biased on this, than to go somewhere with a wildlife tracker. Be it a bird watcher, or a whale watcher, or someone who traps feral pets. 
they see the world in a different way than you normally do. Because they have trained their eyes to look for things that you have trained your eyes not to see. Much of what we see has been what we've been conditioned to see, usually through the lens of some form of judgment or expectation. We will notice the dirty dishes we left in someone's sink, I mean, or their dirty dishes in their messy kitchen, and we will totally forget that, oh, I didn't do my breakfast dishes, they're sitting there. Would someone go, if something happens, would you someone go to my dishes just because? Yeah. yeah. You know, we have Luke and we have Matthew, you know, telling us in the Bible, they speak to us about planks and splinters or loam or specks in our eyes. Quote, hypocrite, first cast out the plank from your eye and then you will see to cast out the chip from your brother's eye. Most preachers are going to be somewhere today using this lesson as a lesson on intellectual judgment. Judge not others. It's, it goes into that whole thing. And the exegesis is about judge others lest you be judged yourself. And they forget that this is actually also a literal teaching. And you know me, Bible, liter. This is a literal teaching that is meant to help us see what is going on around us so that we can help our brother. That's a core of this teaching. It's not just about judgment to sit yourself under. It's about, oh my gosh, I have that. I have that connection. I've had something in my eye too. Oh, let me get that out and then I can help. Let me put on my oxygen mask and then I will help the dog or the child. Or the child or the dog. Or the person next to me. Learning to see without judgment or expectation is a great spiritual task, especially because we, as human primates, it is our primary sense. But there is one sensorial ability that is perhaps the most ignored of all. How many of you had butterflies in your tummy? How many of you still have a couple of caterpillars? <laughs> How many of you had a gut feeling about something? Check all that is around you. Is the cause internal? Is it physical? Is it emotional? Is it external? Is it related to your environment? How is your relationship with whatever you are about to engage in when you have this gut feeling? Oh, great, we're going to Hawaii. Oh, but I thought I wanted to go to Hawaii. What am I worried about? It becomes a point of inquiry not a reason to run to or a reason to run from. That's when we got to engage our reasoning with our inquiring mind. Emeryn Mayer, he's the professor of physiology, psychiatry, biobehavioral sciences at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. I love this quote. Scientists were shocked to learn that 90% of the fibers of the primary visceral nerve, the vagus, carry information from the belly to the brain and not the other way around. Our bellies have a lot to say. Not only that, but this is amazing to me, two-thirds of the neurotransmitters we have are in our gut. Only one-third of them is in our brain. So feel it and then process it. Don't process it and see how you feel. <coughs> We can only be truly present in the here and now if we use all the senses we have been given. They are our holy, evolutionary tools of success. Dr. Stephanie Lafarge, she's a brilliant psychologist, and I was honored to have her be the person who you know, stood for me and was my mentor, said once, our pets are allowed a level of intimacy that we give no other being, not our sexual partners, not our children, not even ourselves. For proof, we allow them to smell all our smells. They can smell our breath without judgment. They can follow us into our bathrooms. 
They can nuzzle our armpits. They know us. They listen to our silence. They taste everything. We need to follow their example. <coughs> it is a holy calling to be fully here, listening to our guts and our hair follicles, and to be brave enough that when something smells bad or the hackles on our neck rise, to pay attention and act on this information. Inquire. What was that? <laughs> to smell a flower or just the blade of grass and laud the beauty that is all around us even while we try to clean up this mess. Our tasks to become fully human and to recognize we are also fully divine in this fully present holy place we call now. <laughs>